Welcome to the 435th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with Heather Martin, author of The Reacher Guy, a biography of Lee Child. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Heather Martin, author of the new authorized biography of Lee Child, titled The Reacher Guy. Lee Child is the author of the best-selling Jack Reacher novels. There were also two Jack Reacher movies starring Tom Cruise, and now there's a new upcoming Jack Reacher TV series in production. And recently, Lee Child has retired from writing new Jack Reacher novels, and his brother, also a thriller writer, has taken over writing the Jack Reacher novels. Heather Martin is here to talk about her biography, The Reacher Guy. Heather, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Well, if someone has read and loved a Jack Reacher novel or more than one Reacher novel, they may not know all that much about the book's creator, Lee Child. If someone listening isn't familiar with Lee, I know you wrote this entire biography, but I'm wondering if you could give us a short explanation of who exactly Lee Child is and what led him to write that very first Jack Reacher novel, Killing Floor. Okay, I will come to that. But I think it's so interesting what you said there at the outset, because when I first read the Jack Reacher novels, I knew nothing about Lee Child. And not only that, I didn't really give Lee Child a second thought. As far as I was concerned, that name on the cover was just like the guarantee of a good read. I wasn't worried about the author. I just wanted another Jack Reacher story. (laughs) And in a way that made me his ideal reader, and we can maybe talk about that a bit more later if you want. Sure. But yeah, so Lee Child, it's a pen name, a pseudonym. I think most people know it and know that and know how he got it even. Jim Grant, born James Dover Grant, in fact, in 1954 in Birmingham in England in the Midlands. And um, always wanted to work in entertainment, that much he knew. But his first love, apart from football and music, was theatre. And uh, for a long time, he thought he was going to work in the theatre. That was his ambition. That didn't work out. Or rather, he had a change of heart, a sort of um, moment of epiphany when he felt that um, as a backstage guy, which is what he was, uh, redundant proceedings. <laughs> and he got a job at a very young age, really, in his early 20s in television, in Granada Television. When he came out of university, it was a time of full employment. He pretty much worked, walked into the first job that he applied for, uh, as I say, at Granada Television. And he was there for 18 years. And he loved the job. He was very good at the job. He rose to a senior position, highly respected. But in the late uh, 80s and early 90s, the company started to downsize. And uh, eventually, he was one of the people who was downsized, just like when Reach was downsized out of the army, in fact. It's a very similar scenario. And he had to come up with something else to do, some other way of earning his living and at that point paying the mortgage and looking after his family. And he'd always been a huge reader from about the age of three. He he just read constantly. It was his favorite pastime, really. And he claims to have been reading approximately 300 books a year from about that age. So he basically thought, okay, I've read a lot of books. I love books. I know what kind of books I like. Why not try writing one? And he basically sat down and did. His wife gave him a year of grace in which to pursue that dream. And he was very systematic in his approach, very determined. And yeah, he sat down and wrote a book and found an agent and got it sold. And the rest is history. And of course, as you say, I've written a whole biography. I can give you as much detail as you want on any of those points. <laughs> Where did the Reacher character come from? Did, did you well, talk the, to him about that? Yeah, the Reacher character came comes from within him, to be perfectly honest. He, he always jokes that it's all autobiographical and that he's just cut back on the violence to make it seem more plausible. Uh, <laughs> and that's a, you know, classically humor, humorous statement. But it does come from within him. It's the kind of character that he liked reading about as a boy, the kind of character he daydreamed about being, and represented a kind of escape for him. Reading was an escape for him as a boy. He wasn't very happy at home. He wasn't all that happy at school. He 
pretty much wanted to escape from it all, the city in which he grew up. And reading was his escape. And he, he fantasized himself about the kind of character that Jack Reacher is. He, someone who would you, you know, solve your problems and save the day and, and enable you to live your dreams, really. Uh, that symbolized freedom. So it does come from within him, but also goes back to a very sort of ancient story, ancient storytelling tradition, really, right back to the sort of earliest wandering heroes through Robin Hood and, and on from there. As we said, Lee Child is a pen name. Where did that pen name come from? <laughs> it's a rather lovely story. The story that's most well known is actually a, a, a touch cynical, people say. He's often said himself that he chose, he wanted a name beginning with C because it would sit nicely on the shelf between Chandler and uh, Raymond Chandler and Agatha Christie. And uh, that would, people were bound <laughs> to spot his books there. And also that it had to be early in the alphabet because people browse from left to right and they get bored quickly. I'm, I'm pretty much quoting him here. And uh, you don't want to have your name beginning with Z because people will have run out of steam by then. He, may, he, he often tells that story as though it were a headed commercial marketing decision. And of course, he does have that. That is a, an, an important part of who and what he is. But in fact, it's actually a very sentimental story. And it goes back to his earliest visits to the States around um, the mid 70s. His wife is um, from New York. And he started visiting the States shortly after he met her in 1974. And I think he'd been to the States about a hundred times before he eventually emigrated. But on an early visit, they'd been to a play on Broadway and they were going home late at night on a train. And it was a crowded train <laughs> and they were chatting. And some guy sitting nearby heard his accent, his British accent, and just volunteered the way people do on trains. I have a European car. And uh, Jim Grant, as he was then, said, oh, yeah, that's interesting. So what car have you got? And the guy said, look, except he didn't say Le Car. It, that was a Renault 5 that was being marketed in the States at the time as Le Car to give it some kind of little bit of Parisian chic. But he actually said, I've got a Lee car. And, of course, <laughs> that delighted Jim as an Englishman and as a writer, always with an ear for words and word play. And it became a kind of in-joke in the family. So they went home and they'd say, oh, pass me Lee salt, have Lee pepper. And then <laughs> when they eventually got married and had a baby, they always referred to the baby as Lee baby. And um, then when Lee Baby got a bit bigger, she became Lee Child. So fascinatingly, the name Lee Child as a name proceeds, and it is like at least a decade, more than a decade before he even dreamed of becoming a writer. So the name was a sentimental choice, essentially, and just happened to fit his uh, hard-headed commercial argument as well. He's very clever like that, managed to cover <laughs> both bases. That's true. Well, you mentioned earlier about this idea of the Reacher character symbolizing freedom. And as if someone listening has read any of the Reacher novels, they know that usually at the beginning of the novel, Reacher is rolling into a new town in the U.S. And I was wondering about that specifically because a lot of the, a lot of the books are really – um, grounded in the U.S. and in the specific area that whatever the book is, that wherever the book is set, that specific book. And I'm just curious, as someone who who may not know, as you just explained, he's he grew up in in Birmingham and in, in England. How much research did he do to get that feel for these very a lot of times out of the way places in the U.S. Yeah, he has travelled a lot in the US. He also is one of these guys who is a kind of sponge um, for information. So if he reads something once, he remembers it forever. And as, as I said earlier, he's a huge reader and he reads all kinds of things, not just fiction. He reads as much non-fiction as fiction and he's reading the news and he's reading the press and he's, he just, he'll read the, the back of the cereal packet or whatever. He just reads everything and he retains information and he loves retaining information. The research such as it is, tends not to be done specifically for a particular book, but uh, gathered and garnered and stored over many years of reading and of listening and observing. And also, let's face it, a lot of it will be from fiction as well. We all discover other places through reading stories sure. uh, about them and set there. I would say essentially it's just a lifetime of reading that's feeding in into that that gives that impression 
of an intimate knowledge of those places. He does have a great love of the of America. And that, again, goes right back to his childhood. And one of the first books he remembers reading was a picture book in the library when he was about four, which was called My Home in America. And it was basically a 12-page book showing 12 different ha- homes or styles of house, kinds of house in 12 different locations in America. And he loved that book. And the page that he loved in particular was the page that showed a little boy rather like him looking out of a skyscraper in Manhattan. <laughs> and, you know, he fell in love with that. And, and I think from a very young age, he wanted to be that boy. And eventually he did make that dream come true. He, he pretty much got that apartment with the view of the Empire State Building and, you know, lived there for about 10 years, thanks to Reacher, who did get him away from, from Birmingham. Sure. As there are hundreds, if not thousands, of mystery and thriller novels published every single year, as you were writing this biography of Lee Child and interviewing Lee, did you ever examine or discuss why Jack Reacher succeeded to the extent that he has as a character and all of the novels becoming bestsellers? What is the appeal of a Jack Reacher novel? I think that Lee would say with his big historical view that it is of course, partly luck and partly timing, that at the point when he started writing, publishers were more patient and in ready to invest over the longer term. Because although his first book was very successful, it took about um, six or seven books for him to really start hitting the bestseller lists and uh, making his mark beyond the sort of crime writing community, if you like, and beyond crime readers. But yeah, I think essentially, (laughs) there's so many different answers to that. But I guess the fact that Reacher as a character has just been so successful that he transcends the books now. He's constantly being referenced in popular culture in, in all sorts of different ways. And people think of him as someone who is a real person, a friend. And the appeal of Jack Reacher, I think, is it largely comes down to that sort of ethical thing, well, where he he basically it, he enacts a kind of justice that an ethical justice that, that we can't we know we can't do the things <laughs> Jack does in reality, but we we like the idea of those things being done and those things happening, and we like the idea of them happening by proxy in fiction. So he's putting things right that we life itself is full of loose ends and frustrations and disappointments <laughs> and things that we can't say. and of course Reacher is especially good at putting things. I guess you could argue that's the broad appeal of crime fiction in general, because there's always a resolution. But I think that something about Reacher that he, you know, enacts that swift justice, and uh, we like to see that done. And then I think just the fantasy of freedom that we all would like to put down our cares and our burdens and our responsibilities. And at the point, remember, when he started writing the character, he was very much burdened by a sense of responsibility. <laughs> and uh, Reacher was, an, as I said before, an escape. Sure. What was Lee's method of writing a new Jack Reacher novel? What was his creative process like? <laughs> yeah, his process, obviously, over the years, has become very finely honed and very different to the first novel. We could talk about a bit about how he wrote that one, if you like. But sure. yeah, he would. He became over the years superstitious. So he would always start on the same day of the year, on the 1st of September, even though he didn't actually start writing Killing Floor on the 1st. But the, the myth took hold that he'd begun on the 1st. And uh, so after a while, he always had to begin on that day. And the thing that, of course, always fascinates people is that it, there's no going back. He writes the book like Reacher lives the stories. And he would say that they both those things are true to reality. It's partly his character. He himself is not particularly given to nostalgia. He doesn't like that much to look back. He likes to look ahead. But he would say, in real life, you can't go back. Uh, so you, neither can reach her. And if, if I go back and revise what I've written in this story about Reacher, I would be falsifying Reacher's reality. I would be tampering with the past. And we all know what happens when how much trouble that causes when you go back in time and tamper with the past. And he, so if he basically has an idea a theme, a strong first sentence above all. 
From the weekend warriors to the renovation dreamers, Lowe's has you covered. We know you take pride in every project you take on. We share that pride, so we're celebrating with Craftsman Days. Tackle your yard with outdoor power equipment, fix that sink with hand tools and flashlights, and tinker under the hood with mechanics tool sets. Whatever your next project is, you'll find what you need during Craftsman Days. Shop online or in-store at Lowe's. Home to any budget, home to any possibility. While supplies last, U.S. only. Think Kings Island is just a coaster park? Think again. It's a get back to fun with family and friends park. A find your new favorite food park. Mm. An outdoor entertainment you'll remember forever park. A beat the heat all summer long park. It's a discover something new every visit park. All this and coasters too. All at Kings Island. Right now, everyone pays kids price. Kings Island tickets, just $45 online. Gets writing and doesn't look back. And the only thing I would say to qualify that, because he's essentially true, and he, if there's a problem at any point in the narrative, he sees it as Reacher's problem and a problem for Reacher to solve, and luckily Reacher is a bright guy. The only thing I, the only qualification I would make to that is that, of course, he he would start every writing session by revising what he wrote the day before or at least re- revisiting it, reading it, and if necessary, editing it before going on. So you could say the whole thing is edited once, but as he goes along, not at the end. And at the end, he'll literally just change maybe half a dozen words. He reads it aloud at the end. And if something doesn't sound right, he might change a word here and there. For him, it's very much, it's got to be, he writes as though, he wants it to read as though someone were telling you the story. So the sound of it, the voice, the rhythm is very important to him. Sure. There were two Jack Reacher films featuring Tom Cruise. And when Tom Cruise was originally announced as the actor for Reacher, many fans reacted negatively for a variety of reasons. What did really think about Tom's casting as Reacher? The Hollywood story goes right back to the very first the day of publication of Killing Floor, which actually is just a couple of days ago, 24 years ago, 17th of March, 1997. The film was first optioned by Hollywood. And it wasn't made into a movie. There wasn't a Jack Reacher movie until 2012. That's a long time. And between those two dates, there had been a lot of optionings and re-optionings, and it was dropped, it was picked up again, it was reworked by different people. And then in 2005, Tom Cruise bought the rights to the franchise, or rather Paramount Pictures did with Tom Cruise. And so he was always going to be involved, and that was clear from the outset, but he wasn't expected to take the part. But as I say, it took so long for the movie to happen that I think there probably came a point when the day that the day that the producer and the producers turned up on his doorstep in, in New York and said, OK, it's going to be Tom Cruise. I think he was by that point not surprised mm-hmm. and also felt basically I've got a split second to say, yes, thank you very much. That's wonderful. Or kiss goodbye to Hollywood. Yet again. And he always loved the movies and he wanted it to happen. And uh, I think he admired and respected Tom Cruise as an actor. And uh, he also, I think the very important thing, which readers have found almost impossible to understand, his fans, and this has something to do with the extreme passion of the fans. It's almost a downside of it. They don't see it the way he does inevitably. He sees a movie and the television series as a kind of a cover of the book, almost like a cover of a great song. If someone else comes along and interprets your song or your book, they don't change it. They don't fundamentally alter it. They don't destroy or spoil the book. The book's still there. So he was in a way quite relaxed about, he knew it would be a different interpretation and whoever played the character of Reacher, I I still think it's true. Whoever plays the character of Reacher is not going to please everyone. And that's the thing, when people have a a Reacher in their head, (laughs) we each have our own Reacher in our heads. So, yeah, it was. was, um, I think it was essentially a pragmatic decision. He's quite a pragmatic man. You know, he's realistic. He'd worked in television, don't forget, all those years. Sure, sure. So he had a respect for the profession. And he's never been uh, someone who felt he had to 
control what happens to his books on screen. I think he has got a bit more control this time around with the Amazon Prime series. He's going to keep a bit of a closer eye on it, but that's partly because, of course, he's got a bit more time on his hands now. Sure. And do you have any updates on the upcoming Jack Reacher series from Amazon? Not much more than is in the public domain, sure. simply that they, I, I think they're due to start filming in mid-April and hope to finish by mid-September. And it might be released in the autumn. Yeah, and and for those listening who are, who haven't heard, who is the actor for Reacher in the Amazon yeah. series? I don't know a lot about the actor, perhaps more. His name's Alan Richardson, and I believe he's in Titans. <laughs> I'm very much a books person. <laughs> I know, I'm not that familiar with yeah, um, Alan the Richardson. Actor he's uh, obviously much closer uh, physically sure, sure. To, to the book Reacher, <laughs> although not as beaten up as the book Reacher. Because the book Reacher was never about being handsome, particularly, (laughs) just effective. As you just alluded to Lee having more time on his hands, and as I mentioned earlier at the outset of the interview, Lee has effectively retired and handed over the Jack Reacher novel writing to his brother. As you were um, writing the biography, did you get any insight into what prompted the retirement and that whole decision process? Oh, yes, many things. And I also knew about it long before it was made public. I think there are, again, a number of answers. One, he's written 24 books about the same single series character. That's pretty epic when you stop and think about it, one a year for 24 years. And also, on top of that, it was very much his second act career. So he, I I think, put very simply felt he'd done his bit. He was quite happy to stop, for himself would like to stop, would like to retire. He would, he ties that all in with his Birmingham upbringing. He looks back to his grandfather and his father, all of whom did an honest day's work (laughs) until they were 65 and, and then retired. And because he has the view of his, what he does, he sees writing as a craft, as a job, he goes to work every day and does his job. For him, he also anticipated, he, he actually literally anticipated retiring at retirement age, unlike many writers. And so that was always part of his plan. He only wanted to write 21 books. He was inspired by John D. MacDonald, who wrote 21, and he intended to stop after 21. But of course, the publishers didn't want him to stop still would never want him to stop. And um, the readers didn't particularly want him to stop. Uh, And I think those things were very powerful. In fact, when I did my research in the archive, I did get a bit of an insight into that because I saw boxes and boxes, and I'm not exaggerating, of letters from fans begging Lee Child not to stop writing the books, uh, not to kill off Jack Reacher, because, of course, that was another option. And And even please not to die himself, because (laughs) people couldn't bear the idea of losing this character from their lives. So I think he had originally intended to kill Reach off in a great sort of scene in in, in the middle of nowhere in a in a bathroom. I think (laughs) it's going to sort of go out in a blaze of glory and die lonely. And it was going to be called Die Lonely, the last book. But I, I think in the end, he just couldn't face it. He, he's had a lot of flack over the Tom Cruise thing. A lot, he would get a lot of flack over killing off Reacher. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got a brother right there who's a thriller writer <laughs> and who was one of the first of three people to read Killing Floor. Grew up with Reacher almost. So from their point of view, it's a natural enough transition to keep it in the family and hopefully keep everyone happy for a little bit longer and give Lee a little bit more freedom. <laughs> sure. Do you, do you know if Lee considered any other writers before turning to his brother? I know. Uh, yeah, I do, and he didn't. You know, it was it, For him, it was a very – they're very close, and it, it, as I say, it just seemed – in fact, I don't think – I don't think he really thought about anyone continuing the franchise. I think the two things came to him together. Oh, people want more Reacher, and oh, I've got a brother. Oh, that's the solution. (laughs) (laughs) Rather than thinking, oh, someone else could write it, who could it be? And starting from that point, I think it was all very synthetic from his point of view. And he liked the idea of his kid brother taking it on, I think. Um, And I think he felt that if anyone could know Reacher from the inside, it it was likely to be him. 
So what led you to write The Reacher Guide? Did you know Lee before you embarked on writing this biography? Oh, yes. And I, as I said earlier, I started out by being a Reacher reader. And then I chanced to meet Lee socially in New York. And we got on and uh, became friends. And we started talking about books and writing and his books and his writing. And we corresponded. And But really, to be honest, I don't think, I, much as I enjoyed the Reacher books and much as he is this incredible publishing phenomenon. I don't think I would have had the idea of doing the biography had I not met Lee in person, because I found him even more fascinating (laughs) than the books that he wrote, even more intriguing. Not surprisingly, I suppose, he contains Reacher, but also exceeds Reacher. He isn't contained by him. And the other thing is that he's as good a storyteller in person, anyone who's heard him speak knows this, as he is on the page. And As we became friends, he would tell me stories about his childhood and about growing up, and I just found those stories so fascinating. And I would always, of course, he would tell me a little story, and then I would ask questions. And one thing led to another, and I found I was taking notes. (laughs) And then eventually we both found that I was working on a biography. And, And so it was nice, really, because it grew out of a conversation, it grew out of friendship, and it was quite an organic process and then eventually he was skeptical at first he didn't really think it was necessary or particularly want it but then eventually he thought yeah why not let's do it and then it then it became official so what is he doing in his work he's a man very much in demand still and i think particularly with covid19 retirement hasn't quite worked out as he planned being called on a lot for events of one kind or another in support of bookshops and colleagues and friends and writers so he's still been doing a lot of a lot more in book world than he might have anticipated and uh, his intention was always just to kick back and read and listen to music his two favorite things <laughs> and he's set himself up very nicely to do those things but uh, yeah he's still very much in demand so I think he's still pretty much just I think people have trouble letting go And maybe in some ways he also has a little bit of trouble letting go. (laughs) But he's quite happy not to be not to be the main person responsible for for churning for for producing the next Reacher book. So what fiction or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh my goodness. Funnily enough, I've just been reading an early example, a very early example of Noir by Ted Lewis, who wrote um, the book on which the film Get Carter was based. And I've just read the book Plender, which was very noir, very dark, much darker (laughs) than a Reacher book really is. A Reacher book is in the end about leaving you feeling good and Lee sees his mission as as I said earlier entertainment and making people feel good and basically happy about things this book uh, very dark but incredibly um, interesting nonetheless it's got twin first person voices side by side of two very seedy characters (laughs) who both come (laughs) to a rather nasty end as they should indeed if there's any justice in the world but I have found that rather fascinating and I read that in conjunction with a biography of the author Ted Lewis called Getting Carter in fact by Nick Triplow, who at the moment is, um, at this, as we speak, is running a virtual festival home. And I was partly intrigued because Ted Lewis is, can be seen as a bit of a precursor of, of Lee Child. And I'm from a not entirely dissimilar part of the country and has the same sort of very strong sense of being rooted in a, a particular time and place, which Lee does. I can see it in the Reacher books, but he has displaced it. So a lot of the things that he associates with his own background and his own upbring- upbringing in his own city, they're in the Reacher books, but they've all been displaced and distributed and transposed to the States. It's rather fascinating. Sure. Are you working on another book yourself now? No, not yet. Not really. I'm still very much immersed in this one. And I've been doing quite a lot of writing around it. And I'm not quite sure which direction I'm going to go in. But as I explained to you, this book took me completely by surprise, really. (laughs) Once I had the idea of doing it, it seemed meant to be and I couldn't shake it off. And I was determined to do it. And also, I felt it was a book whose time had come and people wanted to know more about Lee Child as well as more about Jack Reacher. And and I'm hoping that maybe I'll have that same sense of conviction about... (laughs) another subject in due course. Great. Where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and the Reacher guy? 
Well, I uh, have a very small online footprint and I don't have a website, but I am on Twitter at Dr. Heather Martin and also at The Reacher Guy. <laughs> and that's really the best way to get in touch with me and to find out more and to see the other things that I'm writing around the subject. And yeah, I'm always very happy to hear from readers. It's the best thing ever. A new experience for me and, and a pleasure that Lee has been enjoying for a quarter of a century. <laughs> Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Heather Martin, author of the new Lee Child biography, The Reacher Guy. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Heather, thanks for doing this interview. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Think Kings Island is just a coaster park? Think again. It's a get back to fun with family and friends park. A find your new favorite food park. Mm -hmm. An outdoor entertainment you'll remember forever park. A beat the heat all summer long park. It's a discover something new every visit park. All this and coasters too. All at Kings Island. Right now, everyone pays kids price. Kings Island tickets, just $45 online. It's Macy's July 4th sale with our lowest prices of the season on summer updates for your home. Like 20 to 50% off outdoor furniture and the Radley 5-piece sectional Shea sofa, $1,999. And get a free adjustable base or box spring with qualifying mattress purchase. Plus, Macy Star Rewards members earn on every purchase except gift cards, services, and fees. Sign up today at Macy's.com slash Star Rewards. Savings off sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply.